Even classically, the electromagnetic field can be very complicated. It can have all sorts of waves of different directions and shapes, with many different frequencies and different polarizations. To break this field up into mathematically manageable parts, we use the idea of basis sets or modes even for this classical field. There are many different basis sets we could choose plane waves at specific frequencies in specific directions and specific polarizations, essentially a kind of Fourier basis, are one common basis that is particularly useful if we're talking about empty space. Those plane waves can also be the eigenstates of the wave equation in free space or in a box. If we had a more specific situation, such as some other kind of resonator, we could find a basis set by using the modes we would find as the classical eigenstates or oscillation modes of that resonator, for example. Using a basis set that is the set of classical eigenmodes of the situation we are in, such as free space or a resonator, is a very good idea. It has the great benefit that these different modes can be orthogonal and essentially independent. That means in turn that we can break up something like the Hamiltonian into a set of quite independent Hamiltonians that we can just add up. This behavior is true both classically, looking at classical wave modes, and quantum mechanically. To start our discussion of quantizing the electromagnetic field then, we're going to look at just one specific plane wave classical mode of the electromagnetic field here inside a box. Once we understand that, we're going to be able to generalize to the complete set of modes that classically describe the electromagnetic field. We will then be able to quantize every one of them to get our final quantum mechanical answer. So then we imagine that we have a box of length L in the x direction here. We presume that it's actually arbitrarily large in the other two directions. And consequently, we can just describe our mode as a standing plane wave in one direction here. And this plane wave will have some wave vector magnitude k. We expect that the electric field, which is of course a vector, is going to be perpendicular to the x direction as both the electric field E and the magnetic field B are indeed transverse to the direction of propagation in a simple plane wave. We're going to choose our mode for convenience just to be polarized in say the z direction so the electric field will be pointing in the z direction and it will have some amplitude therefore which we'll call EZ. That's the magnitude of the field, the electric field, in that Z direction. The electric field in the other two directions, the Y direction here and obviously the X direction, is taken to be zero. We also expect that the magnetic field B is going to be perpendicular to the E field. And we're going to choose it therefore to be polarized in the Y direction with an amplitude that we'll call by. And of course, zero B field in the other two directions. Hence, we're going to postulate that we have an electromagnetic field mode in which we have an electric field in the Z direction and a magnetic field in the Y direction. And we're just going to propose that we have this particular form here for them. So we're going to propose that the electric field in the z direction is some function of time times the sine of kx and the magnetic field is some other function of time times the cosine of kx. And we're going to put in an arbitrary constant for the moment, d, in here and for reasons that will become apparent later on we're going to put in a velocity of light down here just for the convenience in our algebra later. As I said, d is still a constant to be determined, and p of t and q of t are at the moment simply functions of time that we've yet got to figure out. Well, what we do now is we check that these fields satisfy the appropriate Maxwell equations. 
And if we do that, we'll be able to justify that our postulations about these classical fields are reasonable. That is, that we're correctly postulating a real mode of an electromagnetic field. And as we do this, it will tell us some other required relations we need between our various postulated quantities here. We're going to presume that we're in a vacuum, so there's no charge density and there's no magnetic materials anywhere. And the permittivity and permeability are therefore given by their vacuum values, which conventionally we write as epsilon naught, sometimes known as the electric constant, and mu naught, sometimes known as the magnetic constant. So we use the Maxwell equation that the curl of the electric field is minus the time rate of change of the B field. That's one of the four Maxwell equations. In our example here, we are deliberately choosing EX and EY, the components of the E field in the X and Y directions, to be zero. And we also note that there is no change of the Z component of the field as we move in the y direction, because we have an infinite plane wave with no variation in the y direction. Then if we were to work out this expression here, this curl of E, we'd only be left with one term. And that would be that dEz by dx is equal to dBy by dt. Similarly, using the Maxwell equation curl of B is equal to epsilon naught mu naught times dE by dt. And noting that Bx and Bz are both zero by choice, and partial dBy by dz is also equal to zero, all of which follow because we have an infinite plane wave with no variation in the z direction, then we're left with this result dBy by dx is equal to epsilon naught mu naught dEz by dt. So with the choices that we made, that Ez was something we would write in this form, By was something we would write in this form, then using a result we've just deduced from Maxwell's equations, dBy by dx is equal to epsilon naught mu naught dEz by dt, that gives us the requirement then, taking dBy by dx in here and dEz by dt in here, that minus kq d over c sine kx, that's what we get from here, is equal to epsilon naught mu naught dp by dt times d sine kx, that's what we get from here. Well, we use the relation that epsilon naught mu naught is equal to 1 over c squared, a standard result in electromagnetism. Then what we're left with, comparing these two equations, is that dp by dt is equal to minus omega q. So we found that our postulated form for the mode of the radiation field, with this form for Ez and this form for By, does indeed satisfy the two Maxwell equations, the curl of E equation and the curl of B equation, provided we have the relations that dq by dt is omega p and dp by dt is minus omega q. And that gives us relations between our time varying amplitudes p and q. Well, differentiating dq by dt equal to omega p with respect to time t once more, that is going to require us, of course, to work out dp by dt here, but we also know what dp by dt is. We know from the relations we just worked out that it's minus omega q. Then we have that d2q by dt squared is equal to minus omega squared q, which means that the electromagnetic mode does indeed behave exactly like a harmonic oscillator, with an oscillation frequency, an angular frequency, omega, because this describes something that's oscillating at frequency omega. <laughs>